I think they're going to have the words up there, but in the hymnal, I think it's 408. Joy to the world. One of the verses is a little different in the hymnal than what we sing in, in youth group. So I had to write it down for myself, so we'll, we'll give it a go. And we don't have a plug-in for this, so we're going we're to try to rig it up here, but we'll do our best. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. Verse 2, no more, no more let sin and sorrow grow, no thorns infest the ground, He comes to make His blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. On the last now. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders and wonders of we're going to sing it on the last again. Get around and shake somebody's hand, find a visitor, and let them, let them know that they're welcome here. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders and wonders of His love. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. Heaven, heaven, nature, sin. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as. As far as the curse is found. We'll sing that last verse again. Have our ushers come this morning for our tithes and offerings. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love, and wonders and wonders of His love. Amen. Let's remember uh, Paul Cinquemani. They uh, rushed to the hospital again, so let's remember him uh, in prayer uh, this morning. Brother Rose, would you pray for us?
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, He wraps Himself in light, in darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And all oh, will see how great, how great is our God. Sing it if you know it. To age he stands, time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead, three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. instruments low. Stephanie to come up at this time. We're going to dedicate little Lucas back to the Lord. Kevin's going to sing for us. moment now I pray and 
and I vow to you this day that I dedicate this baby back to you and I dedicate myself to train and love them like you do I will do my part I will place your words into their heart You have granted such a trust with this precious gift. With your power, by your love, my all I commit on the straight and For your purposes, I say that I dedicate this baby back to you, and I dedicate myself to train and love them like you do i will do my part i will place your words into their heart for i dedicate this baby back to you Twenty-seven, verse 1 uh, says, Lo, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Uh, I want to share just a couple things with you this morning before we pray. First of all, we know that children are from God. Uh, Isaiah 44, verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb. We, we read several accounts in God's Word that says that God knew you before you were ever born which tells me that you are someone even before conception is made. So while the debate continues over when you're a human being and when you're not a human being, I'm here to tell you, you are somebody when God knows you. Amen? Not only does He know you, but God has formed you as well. God made little Lucas exactly how He wanted him to be. God in heaven determined his eye color, his hair color, his tone of skin, his pitch of voice, God made him beautiful in every single way. So children are of God. But we also see children are also a gift. Children are a gift that need not be taken for granted. And Todd and Stephanie have been blessed with a precious gift from the throne room of heaven. So that's why it's so important for them to be the parents God has called them to be. He trusted them enough to give them this precious little boy. And our prayer is that they will keep him in the atmosphere of a loving father and a caring mother. To keep him in a place where he is taught about God in heaven. And to keep him in a church where he will one day come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are a precious gift from God, but they do bring a great responsibility upon their part. And I know they'll be up to the challenge. So we know children are from God and children are a gift. And last of all, we know 
children are grand. Can I get an amen from all the grandparents here this morning? It's been said that the wonderful thing about grandkids is that you can love them and you can spoil them, but most importantly, you can return them. Amen. Matthew 19, 14 says, But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Children are, are so grand that Jesus himself said, Those little ones, they belong to, he, to me and to heaven. So understand, grandparents, the responsibility does not lie alone with the parents. For you too have been blessed with a gift from God. Our prayers that as grandparents you would offer up encouragement. Let Lucas see the love of Jesus when he is with you. In Luke chapter 2 we read how Mary and Joseph came and presented Jesus back to God there in the temple. And in Matthew chapter 19 and Mark chapter 10 we read of little children being brought by their parents for Jesus to lay hands on them and to bless them and to pray for them. So it is scriptural for parents to give their children back to God. So will you, Todd and Stephanie, promise to the best of your ability to raise Lucas in the fear and admonition of the Lord? Will you promise to teach and train him in the ways of God, to take him faithfully to God's house, and to strive to see that one day Lucas' soul will be saved? If you will do these things, please answer, we will. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this family. We thank you for little Lucas and the gift that he is, uh, God, to our family and our church. I pray, God, that... Uh, we would do our part and offer up encouragement and help wherever needed. And that one day, Lord, that Lucas will walk an aisle and give his heart and life to you. We love you. We dedicate him back to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. We have a certificate given as our congregation sings, I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender. chapter 2, begin reading in verse number 10, Luke chapter 2, verse number 10, the Bible says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence this morning, God. I pray if there's one here who doesn't have a relationship with you, God, I pray that they would see the need. Uh, in their life of, of coming to a relationship of your son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this morning. Be with those who are on beds of affliction, are sick, cannot be with us. We want to lift them up, especially today. Keep them safe. For it's in Jesus' name 
Amen. You may be seated. Jessica was four years old. And Jessica had had the perfect Christmas. Jessica had gotten all the presents she wanted. Her cousins were with her to share in the holidays. She had eaten her favorite foods all day long. And as her mother tucked her in for bed, she looked up at her and said, Mommy, I sure hope Mary and Joseph have another baby next year. <laughs> well, we know after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph did go on to have several other babies. However, the first baby born to Mary was conceived through the Holy Ghost. This morning, we want to talk about the star of the show. Uh, we, we're going to hear about the main attraction in Christmas. That is the story of the baby Jesus. Although, I'm sure you've noticed, you never know from the culture we're living in today that this baby Jesus is the star of Christmas. I was researching and saw a radio station last year in New York City. They gave the top five Christmas songs in the last ten years that were requested the most on their national radio station. And I was just going to name them to you, number five, four, three, two, one, but it's Christmas time. So I thought, why don't we just play them? Is that okay this morning? We're going to play you the top five Christmas songs in the past 10 years. All right, guys, let's hit, hit number five. See if you know this one. I'll be home Anybody? for Christmas. Who's singing it? Bing Crosby. You can plan on me. Can we sing this for invitation? Please All right, that's enough. That's number five. Bing Crosby's I'll Be Home for Christmas. Number four, the fourth uh, all-time great song, Christmas song in the last 10 years is, is this one right here. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Let me know who's singing this. With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be a good cheer. Andy Williams, you got it. All right, here's number three. Beautiful, isn't it? Sleigh bells ring, are you listening? In the lane, snow is glistening. A beautiful sight, we're happy tonight. Walking in a winter wonderland. All right, put that up. A lot of y'all are really carnal because you're singing these songs right along with these people. I don't know about this. All right, number two, which I thought would be the number one song, but it's not. It only made it to number two. Go ahead and play this one. You'll know this one for sure. Floridians cannot sing this song because we know nothing about white Christmases. Just like the ones I used All right, that too was being crossed. That was number two. But the number one Christmas song in the past 10 years was, are you guessing it right now? What are you thinking what it is? What it is? All right, I'm not going to tell you. you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire Jack Frost nipping at your nose Anybody know who's singing this one? If you don't like Nat King Cole's version of that song, you might not be a Christian this morning. <laughs> but did anyone notice what all of these had in common? Not one of them had anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. The most popular songs in the last 10 years at Christmas, and you can't even get a silent night and away in a manger or a joy to the world. Well, I'm afraid that Jesus not only gets shortchanged in the Christmas songs, but don't turn on your television because it's true in the many Christmas stories and shows that are going to be played this December as well. 
according to a national religious broadcaster's analysis of 48,000 hours of programming during December 2015, 90% of the Christmas programming did not have any spiritual theme. 7% had a religious or spiritual theme, but never referenced Jesus in any form or fashion. In fact, Jesus was the focus of only 3% of all Christmas programming in December 2015. Now, now the reason that is so amazing to me is because Christmas is all about Jesus. Everybody, I mean, just say the word Christmas. It has his name in the whole name. And, and so we even see it, it's, it's, a, it's about not only Jesus, but Christmas is also about a promise. When you read the Christmas story over in the Gospel of Matthew, You'll find uh, the Matthew continually adds these words, that it may be fulfilled. And what he's wanting his readers to know is this, that there are several promises given thousands of years ago that a Messiah was coming and it was to be fulfilled in this one little baby boy. So at the first Christmas, God gave this world our greatest gift. And I want you to know this morning, if you open this gift, If you receive this gift, there are some eternal benefits that you will enjoy this holiday season. What are those benefits? Well, I want to give them to you. There are three of them. There are three benefits given to you in this passage of Scripture for receiving Jesus. And you can have all of these benefits delivered to you before Christmas, shipping and handling included. Benefit number one, there is the promise of satisfaction. How many of you are born again believers this morning? How many of you could say that Jesus Christ satisfies your every need in your life? See, when you receive Jesus Christ in your life, there is the promise given to you of satisfaction. You know, I found as I've been studying, you cannot read the Christmas story without bumping into angels everywhere. I mean, it was an angel that told Joseph uh, that Mary was going to be with child by the Holy Spirit. It was an angel that told Mary that she was become the mother of the Son of God. And now as an angel is here in Luke 2, he's speaking to some shepherds out in the field. And he begins by saying in verse number 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. Now, contrary to what a lot of people think about God, God is not primarily in the bad news business. God is primarily in the good news business. You see, the reason why God sent Jesus Christ in the first place was to bring joy to this world, not judgment. And you know where joy comes from? Here it is, all wrapped up right now. It comes from you and from me being content with what God has blessed us with. It comes from us being satisfied For what we've already been given, if we didn't get another thing, that we are content and satisfies with what we have been given. I thought the reason why there's such little joy in our culture today is because we are living in a very dissatisfied, materialistic society. I thought when most people even think of Christmas, what comes to mind? What presents am I going to get? Did you know each year an estimated 8,000? thousand tons of Christmas wrapping paper is used. (laughs) Christmas wrap sales exceed every single year $2.6 billion. I'm not even talking about the gift that goes in there. I'm just talking about the wrapping paper. 50% of all paper consumed in the United States is used for gift wrapping. Parents go home today. Try to find last year's gifts your kid wanted so much and see if they even use it anymore. See, society has us saying, get this and you'll be happy. Own that and you'll be happy. Charles Spurgeon said it best. He who is not content with what he already has will not be content with what he would like to have. One sociologist revealed that in 1900, The average American wanted 32 different things and considered four of those things essential. Today, the average American wants 500 things and considers 100 of those things essential. My times have changed. 
Philip Partham tells the story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to see a fisherman sitting idly by his boat. So he asked, why aren't you out there fishing? The man replied, because I've caught enough fish for today. And the rich man shot back, well, why don't you catch more fish than you need? The man said, well, what will I do with them? He said, well, you could earn more money. You could buy a, a bigger boat so you could go out deeper. You could catch more fish. You could then purchase nylon nets and catch even more fish and make even more money. Soon, you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The old fisherman asked, well, then what would I do? The rich man said, well, then you could sit down and enjoy life. The fisherman said, what do you think I'm doing right now? <laughs> See, Chuck Swindoll said it best. He said, true contentment is found not in having everything you want, but in not wanting to have everything. And what the problem is, people are looking for satisfaction in everything but Jesus Christ. And that literally sums up our culture. Neither prosperity nor possessions will bring you lasting satisfaction. Nothing but a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ will bring you true and total satisfaction. I thought even in the greatest psalm ever written, the 23rd Psalm, David put it this way when he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? Want. You know what he's saying? Since I have the Lord in my life as my shepherd, I have everything I need. I want you to know this morning, if you have the Lord as your shepherd, you don't need the latest gadget. You don't need the newest trinket. You already have everything you all need in your life. It's the promise of satisfaction. But then there's a, a second benefit to receiving Jesus. Not only is there the promise of satisfaction, but secondly, there's the provision of salvation. I want you to notice what the angel says here in verse number 10. The angel says, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. See, and the angel goes on to tell what is so joyful about this news in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You see, what you and I needed more than anything else in this old sinful world was a Savior to deliver us from our sins. Someone put it this way. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need would have been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior as a baby in a manger. You know, they estimate there's been 57 billion babies that have been born throughout the beginning of time. But you know, no one was like this baby. Not, not one of those babies ever born could ever accomplish what this baby would accomplish. I thought, here, Socrates, he taught for 40 years. You move forward, Aristotle taught for 40 years. Plato taught for 50 years. And here Jesus comes along, and only three years does he teach. Yet those three years have had more influence than the combined 130 years of teaching from these other men. Ray Ortland took that and said this and put it this way. He said, Jesus painted no pictures, yet the paintings of Michelangelo and da Vinci and Raphael, they received their inspiration from this baby born in Bethlehem. He said, Jesus never wrote any poetry, yet Dante, Milton, and scores of the world's greatest poets were inspired by this baby born in a manger. He said, Jesus composed no music. Still, Beethoven, Handel, Bach, and Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection of melody in the hymns and symphonies written in his praise. And he summed it up by saying this, Thus every sphere of human greatness has been incomparably enriched by the humble beginnings of this little baby in Bethlehem. You know, as I studied what I found, did you know there is no recorded birth in Scripture? after the birth of the Lord Jesus? Did you know that the last genealogy or family tree listed in the Bible is that of the Lord Jesus? And here's why. Because the entire Old Testament, from Genesis all the way to Malachi, points to the birth of this one baby boy. There is no baby like the baby Jesus Christ. And you know what's so great about his birth? It was for everyone. Remember what the angel said at the end of verse 10? 
which shall be to all people. See, why is it that Muslims and Hindus, Jews, Gentiles, all need a Savior? Simple. It's because we're all born in sin. And all of us, apart from Jesus Christ, are going to die in our sin. Now, I know not everyone in our culture agrees with that. But understand, church, that is the truth. Billy Joel, the popular musician, once said this. He said, I wasn't raised Catholic. So, but I used to go to Mass with my friends, and I viewed the whole business as a lot of very enthralling hocus-pocus. He said, here's a guy nailed to a cross dripping with blood, and everyone is blaming themselves for that man's torment. But I say to myself, forget that. I had no hands in that evil. I had no original sin. There's no blood of any sacred martyr on my hands, so I pass on all of this. But I want you to listen to me this morning. If you pass on God, God will pass on you. You can never be saved until you admit first you need a Savior. And until you admit you need salvation and until you receive salvation, you will never experience the good news of Christmas. 1 John 1, 7, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all our sin. If you have a sin problem this morning, I got good news. Jesus Christ will cleanse it. Jesus Christ can take it away. You got a bad pat, Jesus Christ can clean it up and give you a good future. So in Jesus Christ, not only are the promises of God fulfilled, but the provision of your greatest need has been given. But you must accept it. There are three benefits this morning to a personal relationship with Christ. God's promise of satisfaction. God's provision of salvation. Last of all, we see it's God's purpose of serenity. That word serenity means peace. means peaceful. Well, what is the result of this little baby coming to earth? Notice what the angel said in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. What's the next word? There it is. Peace. Goodwill toward men. We're living in a society that doesn't have peace in their life. You go outside. You, you walk across the street. You go to the mall during Christmas. You'll see a lot of hustle and bustle. Not much peace in people's lives. But understand this morning, for every problem that you have in your life, there is a promise for that problem. For every promise, there is a provision. And for every provision, there is a purpose. And what I want you to see this morning, the purpose is this, that we must have peace with God. Do you have that peace this morning? Do, do you have a relationship with the prince of peace. All of us know the beautiful hymn, Old Holy Night. How many went to the movie yesterday? Wasn't that great? Great movie. At the very end of the movie, they, they played that song, Old Holy Night, and they, they began singing it. The carol was written in 1847 by Adolf Adams. Adolf Adams was a, a French composer. Ironically, that Christmas hymn was frowned upon by the church. They denounced it for poor taste and, and total absence of the spirit of Christmas. The reason they did this was because in the first stanza, the writer invites us to close our eyes and imagine this world before the birth of Jesus. So the writer writes these words. He says, it's a world that lay in sin and error pining. That word pining isn't a word we use today, but the word pining literally refers to the wasting away of the human spirit as it grieves and looks for hope. So he writes, long lay the world in sin and error pining. But then come the next three words from the writer. Till he appeared. See, the writer wants us to know it was a world wasting away in sin until Jesus Christ appeared. And when Jesus appeared, everything changed. Amen? We now have hope. We can now have peace. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that peace this morning? Are you today living within these three benefits that only come from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I like the way one man put it. He said this way. He said, God takes life's broken pieces and gives us unbroken peace. It's all there for the taking. All we have to do is receive it. I like the story that someone wrote. They, they wrote, Dear Abby, many years ago, this true story. There was a young man from a wealthy family. He was about to graduate from high school. And it was a custom in their affluent community that the parents would give their graduating children a new car. I thought I would like to live in that affluent community, wouldn't you? <laughs> the boy's dad spent weeks with his son. They were visiting one dealership after another. And the week before graduation, they found the perfect automobile. The boy was certain. It would be in the driveway on graduation night. But on the eve of his graduation, his father walked in, sat him down, and he handed him a small package wrapped in colorful paper. The father told the boy that the package contained the most valuable gift the father could think of to give him for his graduation. The boy, thinking it was a box holding the keys to the car, he quickly opened it. Instead, it was a Bible. The boy was so angry, he threw the Bible down, stormed out of the house. Dear Abby article said this, he and his father never saw or spoke to each other again. The boy went to a far off a state to live with a friend, never wanted anything to do with his father. A few years later, the news of the father's death finally brought the son home again. Following the funeral, he was sitting alone one evening going through his dad's possessions that he was to inherit. And what do you know? He came across that Bible. The Bible his dad had given him that he had thrown down years before. Overwhelmed with grief, he brushed away the dust and he opened it for the first time. And when he did, a, a cashier's check dated the day of his high school graduation, fell into his lap in the exact amount of the car they had chosen together. And the writer of that Dear Abby article said this, the gift had been there all along. All he had to do was just open his Bible and he would have found it. And I'm here to tell you this morning, this Bible right here has a plentiful amount of gifts in it. There's a plentiful amount of gifts in it. It's not what you can buy at the nearest local store, at Walmart, or at the, the mall. Right here has everything we ever need in it. But guess what we have to do? We got to open it. We got to read it. We got to live it. Because in God's word, you will find God's promise for you. In God's word, you will find God's provision for you. In God's word, you will find God's purpose for you. And all of them are wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads this morning? You are most likely in one of three positions in your spiritual journey today. Many of you are, are here, you, you already know Jesus Christ. You have surrendered your life to Him. You have that relationship with God. I encourage you this year to celebrate more than ever the real meaning of Christmas, which is having Jesus Christ in your life. That is sufficient enough. But there's a second group here. You haven't made a decision to receive Christ. You, you've never unwrapped his gift of love 
never opened his box of grace and received his greatest gift, which is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. But listen, today is different. Today may become the greatest day of your life. Because today you may accept Jesus and and God's gift of eternal life. We'll help you do that. There's a third group of you here today. You do know Christ. You've been saved. But you've strayed away. You're not walking with Him like you should. You've let other things, maybe outside things, maybe materialistic things, they've gotten in the way of your relationship with God. You're, you're not as close to him as you once were. And I just want to say that, that God is saying to you today, you can come home. It's time to come back to where you know you're at your happiest. And we're at our happiest when we experience God's peace and God's promise and God's provision in our life. So with heads bowed and eyes are closed, I want to ask you, if you're here this morning, And you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. You're not saved. We're not going to call you out. We're not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you this morning. If you're lost, you're away from the Lord, you've never been saved, would you just slip your hand up by that saying, pray for me. I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved before. Would there be one? Just slip it up and put it right back down. I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. Maybe you're here this morning, you have a loved one who's lost and they need Jesus in their life. You want to remember them in prayer, would you just slip up your hand? Bless all the hands this morning. Now thirdly, Christian, you're here and you've, you've strayed, you've wandered, you've gotten away from the Lord. Your relationship is not as close as it once was. And heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You want to be remembered in prayer, you just want to slip your hand up saying, pray for me. Bless all the hands this morning. All the hands this morning. Bless all the hands. God sees your hands. Thank you for your honesty. We're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to sing a song. If you need to step out, if you need to come and pray, for whatever reason, the altars are open. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your gift of the little baby Jesus. We thank you for your promise that you're going to come again and receive us. But while we're here, we, we thank you for your provision on our life, how you provide for us. And best of all, the peace that we have with you as we live our daily lives. Lord, there are some here who who have strayed and wandered from you. God, you know each and every heart. God, I thank you for their honesty. God, I pray that they would come back to you. There are others here who raise their hand. They have loved ones, God, who are lost. They're unsaved. They're one heartbeat away from eternity separated from you. God, we we especially lift them up today. You know each and every name of each and every hand that was raised for the person who's lost. God, convict them of their need of you in their life. Help us to go from this place today remembering that this month is not about presents and toys and getting, but it's about your son, the son of God coming down to earth wrapped in flesh so that he could live just to die in our place. Thank you for that. We love you. We lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. So we get a song of invitation. If you need to come, would you stand together as we sing? Page 366. Silent night, holy night, all is calm.
Christmas hymns, don't you? Amen. Amen. Great message from the Christmas hymn. Good to be here this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, we do have a, a group coming back tonight, uh, the Griffith family. They were here last year and did a wonderful job. It'll be more like a Christmas service, be singing uh, hymns and different things. So I hope you'll come back uh, for that. Uh, starts at 6 o'clock tonight. That's the Griffith family. Any other announcements before we're We have dismissed? Christmas parties this Saturday. So I know the younger...